This is Grant Harrison from the Water Boys here with Tyler Newsom. <laughs> Tyler, what about the water? Now that's some high quality H2O right there. What's going on, Water Boys family? We're clocking in. You're tuning in. It's your three favorite guys in the Thunderdome on the couch, and we got one name for you Ron Frickin' McLean. We have him in the second half. The big dog, we pulled some strings. We got him. Oh, what a conversation we have coming up for you. But before that, we got a few headlines to hit in sports before sending you over to Mr. McLean. Yes. So, boys, how we doing? I'm doing great. Because we got Rob McLean. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing wonderful, yeah. man. Busy week coming up. I mean, I don't know what else could be on the schedule other than sports <laughs> this week. But, yeah. uh, and tests. I forgot. It's midterm week. Guys on PEI, I would say. You have a midterm this week? No. No, I have it on the 14th. Okay. But, listen, we'll keep it short here because we know what you came to this episode for. It's not for us. We know you love us, but we know you love Ron McLean more. So, each of us has prepared one headline that we'll discuss around the sports world. I think we've got all of it covered. We, you know, all three of us are directors here. So, <laughs> we are the maestros, the conductors. We're the band as well. And you guys are simply the audience. So, here's what I want to get into first. The NFC beast <laughs> of the East. We've got Eagles, Dallas Cowboys. Washington Commanders, and New York <laughs> Giants. Three really great teams. One pretty good team outside the division. They're 16-3 and three when not playing each other. I throw some respect That's on the Commanders name right now, taking down the pack. Yes. <laughs> yes. I do not, man. I do not. You and don't respect why. that? Oh, no, no, I don't. I Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, okay. What, a, what don't you respect about Aaron Rodgers? I'm not saying Aaron Rodgers. He's the face of the franchise. What does he have outside of that? Uh, what does Green Bay have outside of Aaron Rodgers? Aaron Jones. Hope. <laughs> they <laughs> Hope have Aaron nothing. Jones. They have nothing. They're done. A football on the way. They're win. done. They're not winning that division. They're done. Okay, but did, right you, did you expect Saturday night that you would wake up Sunday and see the Washington Commanders beat them? Honest to God, after watching them lose to the Jets, yes. <laughs> Zach Wilson and his milk uh, yes. power be taking over this season. But Jets yes. are on a heater. It do, I, the Jets are on the same level as the Commanders. Yes. Well, the Jets are better than the Commanders. Jets They're a little better bit better than, than, than the Commanders, the commanders yes. but in terms of quarterback play, Zach Wilson did not look good against the Green Bay Packers. And that was a close game, Commanders and Packers. It wasn't a blowout. Yeah, but game, I don't think it? I don't think that Washington beating Green Bay is that big of a shock to me. After watching them beat like the Jets beat the Packers. Okay. Not a big shock. Since we're on the NFC East here, let me see if this is a shock to you. The Philadelphia Eagles are undefeated. That Flat is a shock. Flat. But, okay. but. Thank you. I got but, it. <laughs> Jalen Hurts is playing out of his mind, so. See how, he, see how he doesn't put any respect on the commander's name, but he has Hurts in fantasy, so. No. No, <laughs> that's not it at all. That's not it at all. Biased. No, <laughs> not at all. Shit. Shit. I think the Giants are a great football team. I think the Cowboys are probably the third best team in the division. Um, but Washington beating Green Bay is not that big of a deal, I don't think. If you said this like two years ago. It's Aaron Rodgers. Though. If you, who cares if you who said, they're playing? If you said Aaron that Rodgers two, is clutch. It doesn't matter who's Okay, playing. I know yeah. we're talking about the NFC East here. But Carolina with P.J. Walker is their starting quarterback. Beat Tom Brady yesterday. Tom so, Brady didn't throw a touchdown is Aaron yesterday. Aaron Rodgers and That's Tom insane. Brady on the same level as what they once were? No. So and Tom Brady has I less don't, excuses I don't than Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, though. but I don't understand why you guys are talking about like Aaron Rodgers. Like, oh, he's still top five quarterback in the league. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have a receiver. Like, a, like Cobb's gone. He has no receiving corps. I Yet know. he threw more touchdowns. He, Wait. He only had one receiver yesterday catch a ball. He only targeted one receiver, too. Well, I shouldn't say targeted, but he only had one receiver catch a ball in the first three quarters that came yesterday. You're, you're, just, you're establishing my point even further, though. Aaron Rodgers 
He's not looking at anyone the, else. The Packers still put up. They only lost by three. Tom Brady's and the Buccaneers. He's not. He's they not a, have a touchdown. He's not a. He's not a. Three um, points. That's what they finished the game with. Three. He's not a person who likes to mentor. And likes to work through the growing pains. He's got a really hot movie girlfriend. He can do whatever he wants now. <laughs> okay. okay. So anyway, the NFC East. Yes. The Commanders obviously are the worst team in that division. I think everyone can agree with that. I mean, they yeah, bench cars from Wentz. A hundred percent. Like, the team I'm interested, the game I'm interested to see is the Giants versus Eagles. Like, yes. Sequan versus Jalen. I mean, yeah, basically. Three, yeah. three miracles at the Meadowlands. I'm thinking we're going for a fourth. I don't know if it's a home or away game for the Eagles, is it? Uh, While you're looking that up. But, oh, like I said, three miracles at the Meadowlands. We're in for a fourth, whether that's at the Link or the Meadowlands. That is two teams who now are great, in my opinion. They play the Commanders at home for the first game, and then they'll play the Commanders again. I'm pretty sure they We're don't. talking Giants, though. Right. Oh, sorry. My bad. Anyway, I'm not too worried about Commanders. No. The yeah. playoffs this year, though, they're going to look like a Madden video game playoff bracket. Like, teams that should not be good are good. Teams that should be good are not. Yes, what is going on in football right now? Yeah. Tom Dude, Brady can't throw a touchdown. No. Tom Brady's got stuff going on outside of football, though. I will admit now, too, Broncos country, it's time to die. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> Rams are now mediocre at best. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Just so you were talk, you and I were talking about this beforehand. I just want to cry. I don't want to look at the NFL. <laughs> like, Jays are done. I love it. I Why? Jays aren't great this year. Why? And Broncos I love can't football give me right now. To because it. it's unpredictable. Football is mediocre right now. Football has been predictable for five years. And at least your year team's going to make the playoffs. Like, you still get some my good. Team, my, you can still cheer a bit. Man, I can't yeah, cheer at all. Outside, unbiased opinion. Football is amazing right now. Oh, football. Yeah, it's exciting to see and teams you don't that you What's going to happen every day? And I, I just want to mention, you say NFC Beast, or NFC Beast East. Like, the AFC East is stronger right now than the NFC East by record. By record, sure. I mean, we're we're going to improve to... In, is, that, I say we, is that outside the division or inside the division? I have not checked. But, okay. well, I'm assuming we're going to beat the Bears. Like, I think that's a guaranteed win. That is 100% a guaranteed win. Uh, so we're going to be 4-3 and three after tonight. I think Holland College football can beat the Bears right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, like, if you're looking at it from that standpoint... I'm Shout sorry. out to Daniel there. <laughs> the Bears just suck, man. Yeah, the Bears are terrible. Like, we, so, we know this. Anyway, I think we've tapped out football right now. It's, Let's talk about another team. Philly team. The... Phillies themselves. The f- Philadelphia In a sports Super are just Bowl. Ring them. Super Bowl. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> they're Holy gonna shit, they're gonna man. score a couple goals, go deep in the Super Bowl. They're gonna lift the President's Cup. <laughs> okay. Rewind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the World Series. In all seriousness, <laughs> Phillies are headed to the World Series against the Astros. What are we feeling, boys? I am personally loving the Phillies right now. Yeah, I bet you are. Yeah, no, I just think <laughs> the Liberty Bell is ringing in full effect in the city of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Fly Eagles fly, riding the... the you see the street lights? The yeah. street lights in Philadelphia were being greased up. Yeah. Not even game five yet. Yeah. Yeah. I just think Philadelphia is hot right now. Shout out to Rick McLean here. Even though he might say the hot hand doesn't exist. The hot hands exist with the Phillies. Bryce Harper is insane right now. 419 in the playoffs. So He's five hit. home runs. Five home runs. You got so many good players. JT Reale Muto is hot. Then you got in the outfield. Their outfield is stellar right now. Kyle Schwaba he was, is hitting he was bombs. Cold. He was cold before the se- or this series and just but heated, heated up, up man. bombs. And then you got Nick Castellanos. Like they're still they're killing it. Big free agent pickup. Big free agent pickup. He might have been struggling a bit, but he's hot now. You got Aaron Nola on the mound. You got a solid bullpen. I just think that special players make special plays on special days. And the city of Philadelphia 
They should not be doing anything but riding high right now. Speaking yes. about special players, Bryce Harper had an, had an all-time baseball moment that will go down in history. Bottom of the eighth, the Phillies down 3-2, pitch count is 2-2, and he hits a two-run bomb to put the Phillies up 4-3, which would be the game-winning and series-winning run. I don't know what else to say other than it's, that's yeah. going to be – that tops to, that tops Jose Batista's moment. It has to. Okay, while Taylor's, it has having, to. While Taylor's having a spasm, I just it want to say – It has to. Like, what, this is to go to the World Series. This is to go uh, uh, to the World Series. I don't care if it's to go to the World Series or not. The stakes were so much higher. The oh, environment so was so insane and in that game. Yeah, okay. Props to Bryce Harper. It's a competition, but the moment, just the moment of Joey Bat's bad flip, not compared to that. The it's a good, flip, yes. it's clutch moment. But, but the just the moment itself was moment, so much more intense moment, for Joey. I would say is Bryce Harper. In terms, yeah, he sent this team to the World Series. That's a more clutch moment for that. That's a bigger moment than Jose Batista's bat flip moment. In terms of World Series births, yes. yes. But I'm saying, too, though, they're equal in the fact... The environment was so much more tense in Toronto during that. And also, I mean... The nation still talks about that. The other thing oh, that we have to... Gosh. The other thing <laughs> we have to mention about this is... The Phillies might have the greatest home field advantage in the playoffs. Oh yeah, Philadelphia. They're twenty one and nine, right all time at their stadium. But you also you talk about a fan base that when they're behind you, there's nothing else like it in Philadelphia. When yeah. they're against, when you're playing bad, they're against yeah, you in they're, full force. Yeah. They're okay. horrible. I've wanted to say something since Bryce Harper. Can I finally talk? To you? <laughs> yeah. Can I, I finally talk? I don't know. Can you? Please. Can you? Okay. I doubted Philly against San Diego. I'll apologize. To the city of Philadelphia, I won't apologize to Chris. I think you saw that coming too. <laughs> but I will say this: Phillies got that heat. They Woo! got the kitchen cooking, and Dang I'm God. taking them over the Astros. Thank you. So you yes. got so, it here first, so folks. Grant's cooking. wallet. Grant's wallet. Putting it down. <laughs> Phillies money line right now. Okay, so they're they're cooking in the kitchen. They're heating up. And the Astros are going to come in there with uh, a fire truck full of water and put it out. Mm-mm. You know, <laughs> the the Astros are the best team. I don't know what you guys are missing. They here. were the best team when they lost the Atlanta Braves. I got okay. to say last yeah. year in the World Series. Okay. They've been upset before. They're going to be upset again. No. The Phillies. They're hot. They're hot so at the sh- right time. So are the Astros. How many times did the Astros go down in Game Four last night? They're good. How many times the did the Astros, Astros are go there's down a difference. and come back? There's a difference between being good and being. And hot. who has better pitching? Have you been watching the Phillies baseball yes. lately? I think the Astros have better pitching. They're deep. They've always been good since the 2017 season. They're deep. The Astros They're good. Have, bullpen has given up two runs in 33 innings pitched. And they're about to clash with the hottest team in baseball. I, I also, think... thank you Astros too for sweeping the Yankees. That was a pleasure to watch. New York down. New York down. New York has no idea where to go because they're gonna re-sign Aaron Judge, and that's gonna cost forty million dollars. So he's gonna listen all thirty-two teams too, or thirty. But just like Lil Yachty brought the walk, brought the walk to Poland. Phillies are bringing the walk to the World Series because Philadelphia is getting cooking. a shift. The city of Philadelphia is waited. So, I don't know how many years so since their last we'll championship? Wrap, we'll wrap this up with predictions because Grant's obviously got his wallet out, ready to slam down on the couch, money line. Mm-hmm. But how many games? Six. Okay. Taylor, I know you're going with Phillies two, but. Phillies 4 2 in Philadelphia. Okay. It's just the way this season, the way this playoffs has gone. The way Philly has struggled for a ship to come to their city for the last how many years in all sports. Mm -hmm. Is Game 6 in Philadelphia? Yes. Yeah, because Astros are at home field. That's right. I just think that Philadelphia is getting their Cinderella moment. Is it it like the NLCS where it goes Game 1 and 2 at home, Game 2, 3, or 3, 4, 5 on the other person's territory, and then 6 and 7 back on the higher seed? I forget. 
I think look it up. Yeah, I think you might. I think Justin might actually be right, honestly. I'm pretty sure that's the way it goes all the way through of baseball. It's yeah, because the way the five. series works and travel works, I think it is yeah. two three five two three two. Yeah, exactly. So it would be on the Astros' home field. All right, all right. So Philadelphia and five. five. Philadelphia and five. five. Wow. Philadelphia. Four one. Is it, are you changing yours or no? No, I'm still staying six games. I just. Philadelphia has waited long enough. The way the city is, the way the fans are right now, Philadelphia, I'm behind you. I think you deserve a shit, and I think your fans are going to get it in front of you. Home field, Phillies in five. Well, I'm going complete opposite. Houston, 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 what the? Houston. Well, that's, that's a combination a, of the two names. Yeah, that's pretty it's a great. Good, yeah. Um, no, but Houston in six. The Texas Houston's. Texas, you sh- yeah, okay. And then looking into the last section of uh, this short little intro before we get to the main action. Um, the main event. Vancouver looks like the 2011 team that's about to, instead of you know competing for a Stanley Cup this time, City's going to ride over being the last place in the league. <laughs> They're already riding. Jerseys are on the ice. Fans, the players are at each other's throats. Yep. What a terrible winless start for that city. I know. And they have such a cool reverse retro jersey this year, too. They yeah. do. They, they actually fire. do. Yeah. Um, I'm not talking about jerseys here, but they're facing Carolina Hurricanes, which is just going to be a middle loss one right now. Yeah, pretty much. Freddie Anderson's hot right now. Yeah. No, even worse, even worse than that, they lost Quinn Hughes for a week or so now. On top of that, to make things worse for them, um, after they put, do you see the trailer they put out for their season two? They made like a movie trailer kind of thing for their season, Mission Impossible themed. It was like two minutes. It was actually like two minutes and thirty seconds long. It was like an actual movie trailer. Fire trailer. <laughs> This season, just the trailer looks like a joke now with the set. Just like Tom Jay, Cruise well, himself like, okay, on guys, okay, No, okay, literally, okay, it's guys, all, Like, okay. go watch the trailer if okay. you can find it. It's when you look at how they started, it's such a joke, that trailer now. Guys, all right. Guys, just calm down. Calm down. I'm going to pose a question and you guys are going to answer. Is it an overreaction six games in to say the Canucks are completely written off? Valid. No, it, Certified. It's hard to come back from that. Yeah, six games out of eighty-two. It's hard to come back from that. The start, it's like it's like a first impression. I get. You base I get, everything off a of first impression. You base everything. You're you haven't won a game yet. Mm-hmm. Six games in. There's something wrong there. I love Bruce, but like turning that ship around looks like a tall task right now. Yeah. Here's my stance: is hockey is the most statistical ridden sport full of errors. And to not have a puck bounce go your way in six games, that says volumes. About I mean, they're not... They're going to win this season, obviously. No, yeah. They're... That's they're not ridiculous. going 0 for 80 yeah, yeah. That's yeah. ridiculous. No, what I'm saying is... But they might go 0 and 10. They've... What was it? First five games, they blew multi-goal leads in each of the first five games. First four or five. First, first team five in history games. to do it. So... They it's can't not keep like up they're on not, the games they're winning. It's not like they're not scoring. Uh, like they only scored one goal against Buffalo. Yeah, okay, sure. But they're scoring at a good pace. They're just not closing out games, and part of it feels like that's your Dunko. He's definitely an elite goalie that's not playing elite right now. Same situation in Calgary you as you said earlier with Mark You kind of need him to steal you a game. Oh, 100%. Like, you need him to step up, steal the game, get your momentum back a little bit, get you guys on your feet, that kind of energy right now. You know what they shouldn't have to? Who? A goon. A what? A goon. An enforcer. Trade for Zach Cassian. Ham-fisted. Stud. Yeah, Take well, he's not gonna. He's not gonna matter. Sakasi apparently can't hit worth crap in the, anymore. Mm. Let's find someone in the East Coast Hockey League who could just come up and just start hitting dudes in the face. I mean, one goalie was. He was kind of. A, I was expecting this out of him. Not gonna lie, with Ottinger. But the other goalie I'm about to mention is having an unreal start to the season. Mr. Kadaha. Kadaha, Kadaha, Kadaha. Is back in business. He's 4 0 with a 1.75 goals against average and a 9.49 save percentage to start the season. And Jake Ottinger is also 4 0. Uh, like, you know, coincidental enough, 
they won every game their goalie has played and lost every game their goal starting goalie has not played, mm-hmm. both teams respectively. But Car- er, Jake Ottinger is 4-0 with a 1.25 goals against average and a 9.59 save percentage through four games. I don't know about those numbers, but they seem pretty incredible to start the year. Jake Gottinger, after the playoffs he had, was probably expected to do something like this, but credit to a real young goalie there for actually fulfilling what people were expecting of him. Because it's not unheard of for like a young player to be cracked under pressure. But Jake Gottinger's come behind a Dallas Trump team Bacon. that's... Yeah. Jake Gottinger's come behind a team that's... Dallas is good. They're not great. But they're I think, good. I think they're good. And they're no, definitely they're good. They're really good, but they're not amazing yet. They're not top of the standings. They're definitely going to be in contention. Oh yeah, I think they're a few pieces away from that, from a cup or anything like that, big run. But props to Andre for not breaking. In terms of Carter Hart, I got. I know we said we got one name with Ron McLean, but I got one name for you that solved everything in Philadelphia. John Tortorella. Torts is a madman behind that bench and is a. Stud in the locker room when it comes to firing the boys up and ripping a strip. They didn't touch ripping a strip. Ripping a strip. They didn't touch pucks or sticks for like the first two weeks that he was coach. Didn't touch the ice once. He said they had to fix the locker room. They don't even have a cap. They have one A. One A. That's it. There's one letter on the team and it's an A. Scott Lawton. Just like cheese and pasta is a great combination. Torts in the city of Philadelphia, another great combination. Oh yeah. Perfect. He's got the fire that that team needs. And it's working right now, like magic. They all have a roster that you look at and you're like, whoa. They don't have a single player that jumps off the page and you're like, whoa. Mm, Travis Konechny's good. He's yeah. good, but it's not like, whoa. Yeah. Like, like he doesn't have the whoa player. Carter Hart is playing like a whoa player right Carter now. Hart's woke the bleep up. <laughs> yeah. This guy was projected to probably be, in reference, Team Canada's starting goalie. For the last Olympics, if they were going to the Olympics, before, I want to say, before last season. Because obviously last season he had a terrible year. And the expectations just didn't seem like they were ever going to live up to to them, like to themselves. But after the start of this year, I think he's playing like a Vesna-like goalie. Oh, definitely right now. Like, I know it's nothing, but fantasy hockey, rank, like, you look at that. He's the number two ranked goalie right now. He's ranking up points left and right. He's definitely one of the massive reasons Philadelphia is playing the way they are right now because, you know, Couturier's out. Konechny's currently hurt. Mm-hmm. Like, Philadelphia, shout out to Torts, shout out to Carter Hart. They woke the hell up, and I'm excited for Philadelphia right now. Philadelphia sports is, is something to see right now. I don't know what else to say. It's Rocky type hype. <laughs> Grand Slam or something to say. Speaking of the World Series coming up, where can we watch the big games there, huh? <laughs> you know it. Hunter's Ale House. Thanks for reminding me. Taylor almost forgot. I got too excited about our guest that I forgot about our sponsor for this season. Hunter's Ale House. Get down there. Well, hopefully we kept it short for you folks. I just got a few words left for you. Rob. Friggin'. McLean. All right. Welcome back. We're here with Ron McLean. As we promised, a very special guest today. Ron, thanks for coming on. Yeah, pleasure, Taylor. Justin Grant, it's uh, it's not a big challenge to get me to do something for you and PEI, right? <laughs> there half the time. But anyway, honored to join you on Water Voice. Yeah, we're, we're grateful that you're able to make the time for us. Uh, we'll just roll right into it now if you're ready. Uh, from what I can remember you telling me whenever we had you on the island for Brad's induction to the Sports Hall of Fame here in PEI, you said that you got your start in broadcasting by covering on the radio for a friend? That's right. So I was in high school in grade 10, and I remember I was uh, kind of lounging in the backyard, and my dad, Ron Sr., came to the door at the back of the house, and he said, Ron, there's a Martin Smith from CKRD Radio would like to speak with you. And I thought, oh boy, what did I do last night? You know. Uh, drinking something up you know anyway he was uh phoning me to say that one of my dear friends bernie roth was ill and had been working part-time at the radio station pushing buttons he was an operator not a dj but an operator Uh, and bernie couldn't come into work it was a nine-hour shift that day and they needed somebody and bernie had suggested me said it would be easy for ron to figure out how to 
flip the little lever that plays station identification and to roll the reel-to-reel -reel tape. And I'm sure he'd appreciate the $27. So I said, yes, Mr. Smith, I'll come down and learn the ropes and happily fill in. And that's how it started. I, I joined a rotation of four of us who were in high school that would work on weekends doing this part-time shift for nine hours. And then eventually they asked us to read the news at midnight on Sunday night. Uh, CKRD FM was a little shy of their Canadian quotient of news, weather and sports. So they had us kids do a 30 minute news slash weather and sports cast. And I could do the sports okay, but I crucified the news and yet I was the best of the four of us, so they thought. Uh, and they flipped me over to the AM operation to be an all night disc jockey while I was in grade 11 and 12. 12. And that was with the beginning of uh, never dreamt it would lead to Hockey Night in Canada. I thought it would be a, a hip hop DJ. But uh, anyway, it all worked out. So how did you exactly get the opportunity, opportunity to work at Hockey Night in Canada and Sportsnet in general? What happened was in 1984, TSN started their operation. And they hired a lot of the commentators out of Alberta. John Wells was from Edmonton. Peter Watts was from Edmonton. Jim Van Horn. These are names uh, before your time, sadly. But uh, they were really accomplished broadcasters who were hired away from local CBC affiliates or independent stations in Alberta and brought to Toronto to start up TSN. And that kind of opened the door for me. There was a, a producer who's still uh, doing a podcast. John Shannon works with Bob McCowan on a podcast. But John was a, a longtime stalwart as a producer at Hockey Night in Canada. And he was based in Calgary. And he used to see me do the TV weather. In, in a place like Red Deer, you do everything. So I was the Red Deer Rustler Junior A hockey broadcaster. I was the host and analyst, if you can imagine. As far as the weather, I would go on TV at six in the evening and disseminate the weather for everyone in central Alberta. And I also was a, a DJ pulling down a shift on radio. But John saw me doing the weather on television because it piped into Calgary from Red Deer's only 90 minutes away. And he used to see that I would forecast in addition to the weather, which was me, I was getting it from Environment Canada. It was Boomer Gallant, the weatherman in the legendary. <laughs> PEI said Ron McLean wouldn't know a warm front if he wet himself. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I would do the weather and then because we'd often have to fill a bit, I would also forecast the Oilers, Flames, the Elks, CFL team and the Stampeders. I'd forecast their games just to fill time. And John Shannon saw me do all that and offered me the chance to step in when Jim Van Horn left to join TSN. I auditioned with nine gentlemen and somehow I mean I was such a deer in headlights but John saw enough in me to to give me the chance. So uh, you started two very definitive careers around the same time while you're playing midget hockey there in Red Deer Alberta. Um, you didn't decide to make the main you didn't make the move to juniors you decided to start refing and broadcasting at the same time. Did you know off the bat which career would be your biggest I guess venture. I, I think if the hockey part found me, like I loved hockey. I played it. I wasn't, I was too timid to be any good. I mean, I'm, I'm hanging with the Kennedy boys and uh, my heart's <laughs> in my throat the whole time when Mike and Gary are around me, but, uh, or the Burts for that matter, Trevor could uh, send me uh, out into the middle of the ocean. But I, I knew that I couldn't make it as a hockey player. Those were really tough years. The Flyers were the Stanley Cup champions. Uh, you, you really had to have some gumption to be a, an NHL player of the day. So I, I couldn't see myself cut out for that. But what I did see myself cut out for is uh, maybe CBC National News uh, doing a radio tape show. There was a guy named Peter Zosky had a, a magazine style show on the radio where he had folks all over Canada would be correspondents. One day they'd talk politics. One day they'd talk the arts. The next day it might be sports. And I felt like that was my niche. I would love to, you know, you could see I love to read and I, I love to teach. I, I wanted to be a teacher. I, I didn't say that. Uh, but certainly that was uh, in the back of my mind. If this radio thing doesn't work out, I would be a, a teacher. Uh, but it just, it finds you. Uh, because as I said, I was forecasting on the weather, uh, the outcomes of CFL and NHL games. That's all it took for John Shannon to see, you know what, Ron, actually, his passion is sport. Uh, and we could take uh, his television, you know, a little bit of moxie. I was always, again, uh, so green. And uh, there's so many things even to the day that are wrong. But um, he saw in me that, that love of sports. So when we auditioned, I'll give you an example. There were nine of us to go in and audition. I went eighth in the process. So when I arrived at CFAC Television in Calgary to become the new host of the Calgary Flames, replacing Jim Van Horn, 
uh, I presented myself to Lee Haskins was the receptionist. And I said, Lee, I'm Ron McLean. I'm here for the audition. And she said, that's fine, Ron. There's all the other gentlemen sitting over there. You can just have a seat and wait your turn. And I was just like, oh my God, there's like this many people auditioning for this gig. So I actually went for a drive because my audition wouldn't happen for close to 90 minutes. So I went to a Dairy Queen and I'll never forget this. I went to a Dairy Queen to get something to sort of settle me down. And I ordered what's called a Mr. Misty. It's a combination of a Slurpee and ice cream. And I thought that might fix me and my jitters. But as I was standing in line getting my Mr. Misty, a gentleman walked in who had just had his arm amputated and he had this big bandage, uh, blood soaked bandage. And I literally almost got sick to my stomach uh, right there and then. And I was like, what kind of a day is this? Like, am I ever going to have an audition? Or So I went back to the TV station and I went in and they gave us nine tests to do. One was to do 45 seconds of highlights of an NHL game, Calgary Edmonton. And they were five second highlights uh, times nine, 45 seconds. So they wanted to see if you could keep up. Did you really know the game well enough that you could fly through all those highlights in 45 mm -hmm. seconds? That was one test. They had us do uh, an opening to a broadcast. Uh, so, you know, good evening and welcome to the Battle of Alberta. They gave me the script, but I had to read it. And then the uh, producer, John Shannon, would say, Ron, pick it up a little. This is KTEL hockey. We're selling the game here and uh, you, you've got to project. And I so okay, good evening and welcome, you know, and I felt like an idiot. Too. <laughs> then I had to interview Jim Poplinski was a flame. I interviewed Ed Whalen was the broadcaster for the team. Uh, that one really tough thing they asked us to do, uh, we'll give you a question and you answer it in two minutes on the nose. They wanted to see if you could mentally edit on the fly and count time. They would count you, but you had to finish your thought right at zero. So the question was, tell us about yourself. And it's like, oh God, you know, like what, now what do I do? Do I, you know, pretend I'm confident and uh, come across as arrogant or do I do humble pie and come across like I'm insecure and like, I didn't know what to do, but I just kind of gave a answer. I don't even recall anymore about my air force upbringing and my love of the game. And one thing I did do was finish exactly at the two minute mark. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what got me the gig, but no, never dreamt of it. Uh, you know, loved I was an only child, loved TV and radio. So as I say, I think it kind of finds you in the end. I was going to say, so, I mean, you, you say that you had like such a great career path leading in broadcasting, but we do have to recognize that you were an NHL, I guess, referee. You did a referee a preseason game. Um, so you were very close to being an NHL referee by the sounds of it, uh, can you kind of give us more information on that and how that all came about? Well, first, a funny story about that. I was at the Blue Jays game where they lost the 8-1 lead, game two of their uh, wild card series recently. So <laughs> I'm sorry to bring this up for ball fans, but I'm oh. at the game. Elliot Friedman got uh, Carolyn Cameron, Kathy Broderick's an iconic uh, producer with Roots and Tignish. Uh, Kathy and I were all at the game. And so anyway, they, they're starting to screw up. But in the process of that, game there were five different times when the catchers would go to the uh, first or third base umpire for an appeal on a check swing and five times it went against the blue jays so i'm a spectator and i'm boo you know like <laughs> everybody else and this gentleman sitting to my right who i didn't know says ron you were a referee what are you doing you know <laughs> it was the funniest thing that he kind of called me on that um but I, I wanted to referee the Olympics. That was uh, the dream for me. I was a level five with Hockey Canada, could have become a level six at any time. Uh, they were always, you know, there was an invite to go to the level six and you need that to do the Olympics or the world juniors. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happened that again, kind of changed everything is in 1998, just at the time I was kind of in my uh, prime as a referee, I was mid forties and I, you know, those are the refs they want. Uh, the NHL came and got involved in this in the Nagano Olympics and they brought their referees with them and that oh, meant okay. the most amateurs getting the shot at because uh, a guy in central Alberta where I grew up Bernie Haley I used to do all the public address announcing for the Red Deer junior team and I refed but I was a ref and he was a ref so I never really worked with him but Bernie Haley from little Innisfail Alberta he did the Olympics in Lake Placid the legendary Olympics where Team USA beat uh, Soviets uh, and so he was kind of a hero of mine on the officiating side, but got close Did that preseason game with Steve Wacom, who's the director of refereeing. And I always remember a uh, two man system or a four man, if you will, with the two linesmen, uh, 
honestly, you're never really caught. Like when it was the three man system and you're a solo referee, you're on one goal line and a guy like Crosby takes off, you're dead. But in yeah. our system, you're kind of back out lingering at center ice, waiting for the play to come your way. You see the turnover, you can back up comfortably. Uh, I will say a lot of the referees, you know, weren't great backward skaters and that's everything now. You have to be a great, mm -hmm. you know, almost call from defensemen. Uh, when you pick referees, because that's the art, is to be able to really move backwards to to get out of the way. And I did it with Steve Wacom and uh, Crosby was in the game. Danny Breer, Maxima Finneganoff was a Soviet who could fly Russian. Uh, and John Leclerc really caught my eye. He was a big guy, played on the Legion of Doom. Detroit's got a new line that's full of six foot eighters. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, so Elmer Soderblom, six foot eight, magic hands. But back in the day, the biggest line in hockey was the Legion of Doom and Leclerc. I had no idea he was such a fast skater. And I, I remember saying to Craig McTavish the following day, former coach, uh, I said, geez, Craig, you, you played with Leclerc in Philadelphia. I had no idea he was that fast. He said, well, Ron, the problem is he had a wonky back. So like he could do that once, maybe every 10 games. And then his back would seize and, and he really struggled to get around. The majority of yeah. but went on he could really motor, motor. Yeah. no it, there's there's nothing like a three-man system to make you realize how out of shape you are as a referee i can tell you that but, but uh cool. one thing i want to mention, and a goalie who can move the puck you know you, that's the worst and, <laughs> you know, yeah. goalie, and you're from on one end of the next in a matter of seconds exactly no one one thing i wanted to bring up i'm still trying to get past the uh the little blue jays blow by there but uh working at sportsnet now you have a lot of former NHL players joining, like Keith Allen just joined the broadcast the other day. Uh, you and Kevin BX are always on together. Who's a former NHL player or a former athlete who you've worked with that really surprised you with their broadcasting abilities? Well, for sure, BX. Uh, like the first show we ever did. So the first show we did, I brought up a thing called Pyramid Power. There was a coach in Toronto named Red Kelly who in the 1970s uh, had this idea to put pyramids underneath the Toronto bench and the energy of these pyramids was supposed to give the players invincibility. And I, I said this a little bit about the pyramid power and right away, Kevin BX says, oh, absolutely. The aquifers, right? The energy source, there's capillaries of uh, chambers in the ground that have water that creates an energy that moves upward and that's what sustained life in the pyramids. And I'm looking at this guy thinking, wow, I wasn't expecting that. And then the second show we did, we're on the desk and uh, he had a, a trident because I really liked Brett and I still do. Brett Kulak plays for the Edmonton Oilers now, but he was a Montreal defender. Yeah. Kevin w wasn't a big fan of Kulak. He was just into Ben Sherratis from his hometown of Hamilton and Shea Weber and Jeff Petrie. He called those three Montreal Canadians the trident and he had an actual Neptune, God of the Seed <laughs> trident with him you know, on the desk. So he was going to show a little highlight package about these three guys. And he says to our producer brian spear he said brian can you just give me like about 20 25 seconds on camera before you roll the video so that i can properly set it up and i think this is his second show on television uh he was and is incredible he has like he's a physicist his father al runs the biggest union in uh, british columbia you should see his father do a speech he, he he's got genius ways about storytelling his dad al um yeah he, he's the one but but beyond that, you know, I, I was so lucky, you guys, all through my career in horse racing was a guy named Jim Bannon at Woodbine in Toronto. Freaking amazing. He would, he would, as soon as the race would start, he needed to see a furlong or two of the race, and then he'd circle the order of finish. He just needed to know that the horse he felt was going to win wasn't boxed in or, you know, hung up in the gate. Um, he was incredible. Jim Nelford on golf, uh, a guy named Jeff Gowan on track and field with Don Whitman. These guys are, you know, some of them are not around anymore, but they were all brilliant teachers. And that's, you know, now when you look at Kevin BX, he's got his academy in California. Uh, Jennifer Botterill and her husband, Adrian LaMonaco, run a great hockey program here in Toronto. Al, uh, sorry, Anthony Stewart, uh, he and Shantae run a great hockey program, Hockey Equality, and he teaches uh, so that's the thing. If, if you have someone like Keith's going to be good because he's funny and he's right out of the game. So that's attractive to us. You know, the stories are fresh, but the others are all great teachers. And in the end, that's what it's about. Awesome. Wow. So yeah, no. go ahead, Taylor. Oh, no, no, you got it. Yes. Two words, one name, one person, Don Cherry. What is it like working with a personality like that? 
Well, I mean, it was it was another worldly uh, 33 years. And that's the, the hardest part to believe is that we survived 33 years. And uh, <laughs> it's unfortunate, you know, that what happened, the, the world is just moving uh, in, in a new direction and Don had had it, you know, it just wasn't his cup of tea to kind of go along with uh, the flow of social justice, making advancements and increments. So, you know, I mean, sure, Jamie Halton could tell you, he, he coached for Don and uh, he was he was on the one hand, you know, uh, an angel, and on the other hand, uh, he still had that 32-year-old uh, American Hockey League, somebody's trying to take my job mentality that if you messed with him, uh, you know, he had so many things. Uh, he, if, you know, he couldn't say sorry. He, he did once apologize, and that's when he kind of went a little too far uh, with uh, Chris Nyland and Jim Thompson uh, and uh, Stu Grimson. He, he kind of accused them of being sellouts, and uh, he went too far, you know, ratting on them. Part of what he'd said there was great and true, uh, but he just knew he'd went gone too far. So he wanted to make up quickly with those guys. They're birds of a feather, right? Uh, mm -hmm. so he didn't want his flock to be alienated. So anyway, with with us, uh, it was a joy. He was he knew how to tell a story. He was uh, you know I, I would help him, of course, to remember the story. But that was the funniest part is when, like, oh, here's a one of my favorites was in 1989. Calgary won the Stanley Cup, but they barely got out of the opening round. They were I can't remember how many points better than the Vancouver Canucks, but it's probably like 40, 48 points better. And now it's uh, the sixth game and they lose in Vancouver and it's going to a seventh and deciding game. So I'm sitting with grapes, having a beer right after we'd gone down to the steamer in the Bayshore in Vancouver. And I said, here's what you should say, Don, this is right up your alley. You should say, I hear that the whole key to the deal uh, is Cliff Fletcher, the general manager had a, a talk with the team on the bus as they drove to the airport to return home to Calgary. And it was a heart to heart with the general manager and the team. And you should sort of paint the picture and it's Cliff Fletcher in the wheel well at the front of the bus. And he's about to address the team. And then he says, uh, oh, hang on one second. Y'all have the, uh, he kicked everybody off, right? The coaches have been kicked off, the trainers, the bus driver, the media, no one on the bus, but the players. But as he's about to do the talk, he has to go, Wait a minute, I'll have the, the Finnish, the Czech, the Swedish, the Russian interpreters back on the bus. <laughs> Something Don would say, right? I put him up to it. I feel bad. Lord, don't you know, get me fired today. This is 2022. I shouldn't even be telling the story. But back in the day, that seemed acceptable when we didn't know any better. And so now we're on the air, game seven, and it's the coach's corner. And Don's going to do this little dissertation about Cliff Fletcher's very meaningful heart to heart with the players, but needing interpreters. And he forgets the story. He forgets how it kind of works. So I'm I'm right away interjecting, well, he probably had to kick everyone off the bus, but the players said, I know, I'm the one part of the story here. You know, of course he did, he completely forgotten. And I end up on the floor like a blood stain. Uh, <laughs> what could you do but laugh, right? And I did laugh at all those things when they happened. But unfortunately, as I say, that uh, little did I know I was raised in a, in a setting that was a, a bit idyllic and I, you know, you guys, this is a this is kind of a important thing to say to you, but it's the key to the broadcast business is to be yourself, of course, and is to speak to a, a listener or a viewer or a reader who is like you with your sensibilities, your sense of humor. That is how you make the great connection. But the problem with that is, is if you're only speaking with like minded individuals, you're alienating others. And that's what we didn't know. We for I don't know how many years we just kind of sailed along in our little tight community and I know a lot of us kind of cling to well it was nice that way you know did we have to change but yes of course we have to change we have to grow if not change and uh, yeah it's too bad but it was a it was a fun 33 years and honestly I, I don't want to speak for Don Don could say but I think he was kind of happy that it ended in a little bit of a ball of fire for him and the travel was getting to be uh, tough and I mean you just can't keep topping a topper and he had he'd gone so far to the top of the summit <laughs> that there was nowhere yeah. to go down. So, he, so I think it's probably just as well, right? I don't know. So I, I would like to ask, is there one show in particular throughout the 33 years that just like will oh, never leave your mind? Is well, there one that's, I know that there's probably a bunch of sick up, but is there one that really yes. just... Some are like, uh, they're bad, right? Like uh, I remember when he kind of cold cocked me with the idea that women don't belong in the dressing room, you know, and it is, he wouldn't tell me when, when he knew he was going to go into something that was going to be very controversial, he'd keep me completely in the dark and then spring it on me. But the problem with springing stuff like that on me 
is I think I'm a, an educator. I have all these books on ethics and I, I start to chime in on what I think, you know, is the truth of the matter. And that was one, you know, and Kathy Broderick, as I said, from Tignish, uh, who was sort of the architect of getting all our clips together and helping us on the road and just a real, you know, sort of a third person in the, in our trident of Ron, Don, mm -hmm. and Kathy. She, she knew, but she couldn't tell me. She was sworn to secrecy that Don was going to spring this idea of, you know, no females in the dressing rooms reporting on hockey, which is it's ridiculous. You know, I, I, you know, I understand. We all understand where Don's, again, as usual, Don's got an element or a grain of, or a kernel of truth in what he's saying. But, you know, it's like, you just can't keep shutting the world down. So that's, that was one where I, you know, and, and I remember a lot of those, you know, where I just felt... I had to kind of try and uphold the the virtue in all of this and that felt clumsy it was you know you knew you weren't going to be popular you, you had to have the courage to be hated to to sort of play that role of uh trying to tone down these because it's a it's a you know the world is ripe for a populist leader uh the world is ripe for uh what is status quo convenient tradition you know yeah. but tradition really means compliance it doesn't allow for the new uh person to enter into the into the equation so that was a that was the hard part but look uh past that it was just god it was fun and uh yeah i i, I could name it you get my book uh cornered and you can read about all the as i say if i recite these stories now in 2022 i'm this will be my last show <laughs> now uh, another show that you were uh probably really well known for is hometown hockey now i just am very curious to know what that was like for not only your life but your career traveling around to so many different cities like that and just what kind of an impact it made on you having a show such as that one well there there's where i thought my air force upbringing taylor you know really uh I moved around a lot as a boy. I was born in Germany just because dad was stationed overseas in France, actually, but through complications and labor, I ended up being born across the border in a nicer hospital. We lived in Metz, France. We moved to Victoria, first to Nova Scotia, then to Victoria, then to Whitehorse, back down to Nova Scotia, then over to Alberta. And that gave me a real sense of uh, the country and, uh, you know, that we all have our little colloquial, uh, parochial uh, beliefs that we're the best. But once you, you know, boil it all down, we're all the same in Canada and the world for that matter. You know, I have a tough time even wrapping myself in the Canadian flag. But uh, the show was, uh, you know, it reminded me of ABC's Wide World of Sports. I mentioned a guy, Peter Zosky, in his Morningside show that was a, a radio show that connected the country. You could add Rick Mercer. Uh, there's other shows that do that kind of traveling, uh, still standing. I, I, I just think it's... Uh, was so nice to shine a light on the minor hockey programs, you know, whether it was hockey day in 2012 in Charlottetown and Summerside, or whether it was a uh, craft hockey bill when we went to on behalf of O'Leary to Summerside. And certainly we got to do the Rogers hometown hockey show in the two big cities on the Island. Uh, just to, just to showcase uh, the great people involved like Forbes McPherson, I'll come down and help Forbes when uh, the university cup is there in March. Um, the Kennedys, their legends, of course, the McMillans, uh, the Burts, the Carragers, uh, you know, I could go on for hours. That doesn't happen without a show like that. And uh, it was, you know, it's unfortunate. We just kind of ran out of towns. We were starting to go back to Grand Prairie, back to Prince George. And I think, you know, the, that was probably what got us in the end. Some shows, I could wish we could have done, done Flin Flon Manitoba, but we didn't have the fiber optic cable to get out of there with a show was what I was told. Uh, trail bc there's a lot of uh, wilcox there's a lot of places i'd love to have gone that we didn't get to uh, but it was a great great experience and i think a really i always said it isn't the biggest show on hockey but it's the most important show and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. that was to me to showcase john lyons john goyans or he would coach the lac st louis lions major triple a team in montreal area or uh, john bachelor coach the burnaby bc major triple a's i mean these are the men that gave us Joe Sackick or gave us Martin Brodeur. And that was really lovely to be able to sh shine a light on them. Well, yeah, because like you said, it doesn't matter how little or where it's from, a great player and a great mind can commit anywhere. And it's nice to showcase something like that. Exactly. Like we, we were down in Murray Harbor to do Brad, basically an homage to, this was when we did Hockey Day in Canada in 2012. 
shot the opening in Murray Harbor, like an idyllic day, snowy, the ice in the harbor was in. So the I was there actually with you. Yeah. There? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you were I, uh, that was a funny story I had. Yeah. And there's a, yeah, uh, that I have yeah. that on my door. <laughs> yeah. So there was yeah, a, no, uh, well, you go on, tell me what you remember. Oh yeah. No, I, uh, I remember me and my uncle Brian, uh, we met you at Deloitte and uh, Glenn's old place in the harbor. And uh, they didn't tell me you were coming. And anyways, you show up and I was like, oh, oh my God. And uh, the one thing I can remember from all that, at uh, the meeting at the house anyways, I used to be a huge Steve Ott fan when Brad played in Dallas. And I remember you telling me, try and be a little less like Steve Ott, a little more like Brad Richards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, yeah. I, I loved, uh, uh, Steve Ott had a t-shirt when, when training camp was held on the island, right? The Dallas Stars came up. God, this is a funny, uh, so many funny memories of that. Jamie Ben was a wide-eyed rookie. And I can remember him yeah. up at the Sportsman's in Charlottetown, just looking around like, this is the NHL. Uh, Brad was you know, Brad's such an incredible leader. He had lobster for everybody and he kind of served it up over by the dark boards. And so we're sitting at a table. Uh, I'll never forget. Chris Barch was a Dallas star at the time. And it's myself and Trevor Burt and Brad Richards and Chris Barch. And Colleen was the waitress who worked for Gary Kennedy at the Sportsman's. And so this Chris Barch is a bit of a Steve Ott type of guy. And he, he was ribbing Brad Richards. I mean, Brad is king, right? Nobody makes fun of Brad on the island, but Chris Barch couldn't resist. And that's so hockey, right? And he says, gee, Brad, you got a lot of teeth. How many teeth you got in there? That's quite a set of teeth you have. And I can't believe he said this to Brad Richards. And then finally, Colleen comes around. Anything else, guys? And Chris Barch says, yeah, we'll have uh, another round and a pail of carrots for this guy. Points <laughs> you know, this kind of mischief was happening all through the night. But as the night progressed, I remember I wanted uh, Steve Ott's t-shirt and he wouldn't give it to me. So uh, that's what I remember. And that's maybe why I convinced you to go and steer clear of Ott. <laughs> but great guy. And, and you have good taste and, you know, great coach now. But it was a, that was a magical uh, thing to have the training camp conducted in. The, uh, oh, it was, it was incredible having the game in the, uh, what is now the East Link Center. I'll remember that. And yeah, skating on the Harbor for that intro was incredible. Well, back to uh, uh, Barch for a minute. The next day, uh, they had a, like a red and white game. It wasn't even an exhibition game, but it was at the East Link Center. And Chris had to fight. Like he'd been drinking beer with us the previous evening at I don't know what hour, but not that late, but around 10 or 11 at night. And uh, it's a noon matinee. And you can hear this, the, the sound of flesh all through the arena. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if he isn't in concussion protocol, no one will be. <laughs> but he, yeah, he got through it. and. Uh, it was a it was a very and the the hockey day in Canada too was a unbelievable experience right from Glenn and Delight hosting us down there and and then I remember uh, we finished up at uh, Summerside and I needed to get back to Charlottetown to meet everybody at the Spo for last call and poor Gary had to close the bar because you know they had liquor inspectors that had been after them again so mm -hmm. I, I took my life in my hands got a ride home with the president of minor hockey PEI and we we drove through Fredericton and it was like just sheer ice. But we managed we managed to get back to Charlottetown and ended up in my room at the Delta. Poor Delta. It's got to be a law against me staying there. Uh -huh. Whatever it is now. Married now, I think. Uh, so, I think it's still a Delta. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Grant. So for an average fan, it's the moment their team won a championship or won a trip to a Super Bowl, Stanley Cup, World Series, whatever. For you, in your position, how does a broadcaster choose their favorite and most vivid moment in sports? Well, it's a lovely question, Grant. I just did a video for a producer of ours, Jeff Girdat, who's a, a younger guy, still referees a lot of hockey, referees my beer league. And uh, <laughs> he got to produce the Stanley Cup final last year in Tampa and uh, Colorado. And he said his aha moment was when the cup was lifted out of the box. And he, as the producer, got to say, we're now putting this shot of the Stanley Cup being removed from its case you know, with Mike Bolt and Phil Pritchard and uh, Scott North. And he, he just felt that was his moment. For me, um, Dave Hodge throwing to me, you know, the, the, to sit on in the chair. Dave, the first show I ever did on Hockey Night in Canada, Dave was actually in Vancouver at the Pacific Coliseum, was the old rink there. And he threw to me at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. And I'll tell you, my heart was pounding so badly. I used to have a lot of anxiety issues anyway, all through until I was about 35 years, I fought uh, fight or flight panic attacks and that 
clearly was going to set one off. Although I was better there than sometimes, like I remember my second NHL awards, I was just like, I'm not going to make it. Uh, but yeah, to, to have Dave Hodge, uh, I just went to his home the other yesterday. I just popped over to Dave's house to drop something off. And when he threw to me, that was, uh, you know, I would assume it's like what Yari Curry must have felt when Wayne Gretzky feathered one over or when Sidney Crosby passes you the puck. That, that was the sensation for me was to hear Dave Hodge saying, now, you know, at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, pleased to uh, welcome Ron McLean. Ron, you know, it's for cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. So my next question for you is you've been to PEI multiple times uh, as we were just talking about hosting the Hockey Day in Canada here and all the great events that were involved with that. And then you also made the uh, surprise trip down for Brad's, Brad Richards' uh, PEI SHOF, so a Sports Hall of Fame induction here on the island. And just can you take us back through that friendship you have with Brad and just kind of maybe a reason why you just enjoy coming back to PEI? Well, all the names I've been throwing out uh, are a big part of it. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, you don't go back to someone's house because you like the furniture. Uh, just love, uh, you know, it all began uh, during the lockout in 2004, five, the NHL wiped out the entire season to get their salary cap in place. Uh, and I came down to, we were all across the country, a producer, Mike Dodson and myself, we were shooting uh, movie night in Canada and we would go to little places and find a story and we'd get minor hockey involved and say to the kids, you know, do you have a favorite movie? Oh, well, you're lucky. Legally Blonde is coming up at eight o'clock here on CBC. And uh, <laughs> I was flying in. Kathleen Casey uh, was uh, on my flight. Uh, she was the speaker of the house in Prince, on Prince Edward Island. And uh, she happened to mention that she'd heard Brad Richards and Grant Marshall were both on the island as we were rolling over to UPEI to shoot this with the kids. So right away, we started the ball in motion to see if Brad would join us, and he agreed to come by, and Brant Marshall did as well. He was up in North Rustico at the time. So it was really phenomenal to have uh, Brad and Grant as part of our uh, little show that we were taping. And then Brad said, what are you doing after? You know, Brad speaks, and what are you doing after? And I, I yeah. said, uh, well, I, I was going to go to the Merchant Man Pub across from the Delta and have a beer there. He says, well, Ron, it closes at 11. Why don't you join us? Uh, there's a new place called the St. James Gate. Uh, Corey Doucette's the owner, and Brody, the bartender, is a great guy, and uh, we'll meet you there. So, sure, I'll be glad to. And so Mike Dodson and I go over to the St. James Gate, which is right next to the sportsman at the time. And... Uh, I remember walking in, I always say this, uh, Brody was behind the bar and there was three or four guys. There was Corey Doucette, the owner, Brad Richards, Trevor Burt. That's it, actually, just the, the three guys at the bar and uh, Brody, the bartender, and they're all wearing black shirts. And they look, I mean, the bar was like uh, Soho District of New York City. And the guys looked like, I, I always said, you know, one was an XL, one was a uh, large, one was an XL, one was a double XL, and one was a metrosexual. Uh, but they, all were, they were all very progressive looking guys. It wasn't quite what I was expecting. And that was it. The bar was empty. Not a soul at uh, 11 o'clock in the evening. Well, by midnight. What, what, like what circa, day of the week, though? Or do you was remember? That, it was no. a, uh, I don't remember the day of the week, but it was told to me, Justin, that everybody likes to drink at home and not spend all their money all night long. Uh, but they do like to come for last or, you know, second to last call. Uh, and that way, you know, broke uh, having a few drinks. Yeah. So that that was not unusual for the bar to fill around 1130 in the evening until closing time. And it was a great night. And uh, I stayed an extra day. I, I, this is, this became a bit of a pattern, a uh, very disturbing pattern for my wife, Carrie, to endure. Uh, but I decided to stay because Brad had a little uh, fundraiser for, I believe it was for the hospital, for sure. Uh, I think it was with an accent on uh, cancer research. Um, is this the golf tournament? No, this was, he was going to be a celebrity bartender at the gate the next day. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, so he invited me to stick around and celebrity bartend with him, which I agreed to do. Uh, and that's that's where it started. And, uh, you know, in those years, Brad was like, he'd just come off winning the Stanley Cup in 2004 with Tampa. He could literally not walk around on the island without uh, the Summerside and the Charlottetown police uh, right next to him to kind of help him because he couldn't get anywhere. So he would walk with his head down all the time, hoping nobody recognized him. And <laughs> But we talked hockey a lot. Uh, I remember uh, during that stretch, Joel Ward, who had an incredible NHL career, he was a player at UPEI at the time. So a lot of the Panthers were in the bar that night. And, and Brad and I just sat and, and talked uh, in, in one of the back rooms at the gate. And I remember telling him how, you know, he had 186 points Brad did in Ramuski in 
Sid's best was only 168. And he's, yeah, but he was 16, Ron, for heaven's sakes. It was his second year. I got the 186 in my third. Are you stupid? You know, <laughs> he, was, he was really great. To, and anyone who's ever talked hockey with Brad knows this, uh, you know, just an incredibly uh, well-versed uh, mind to talk, not just hockey, but sports in general. And uh, so that's how we kind of struck up the friendship. And then he had the golf tournament was planned for the summer at Dunderhaven Brugnell. And I came down for that. And through the years, we would, you know, headquarter at Brackley Beach, uh, Trevor Burt had a home there. And uh, then we would just go to Brad's tournament and stay an extra day or so and play music. Uh, Terry Ryan was just like a inferno rolling into, you know, the tournament with all his songs. And he would always, he would always leave when I would get on the plane the, the final day, he would leave me with a song that is going to be the song. And one of them was Jerry Rafferty, Baker Street became my favorite song. I knew it from back in the seventies, but kind of has lingered as my favorite song of all time. And there were many others. Uh, one year it was Elton John. Uh, I guess that's why they call it the blues. One year it was Frank Mills, Music Box Dancer, which is a crazy little piano ditty. Uh, but that's Terry Ryan for you. And that, and that just became, a, you know, Brad would hook up once in a while when he came to Toronto to play. We would go for dinner and it was nothing crazy. We loved to text. You know, we would text back and forth. There's only two people that have played in the National Hockey League in my near 40 year career that I've actually communicated with while the season's on. I've always kind of kept a, a, a bit of a barrier because I didn't want my my approach to be sort of uh, prejudiced or biased by my friendships. But Brad, I couldn't resist because I got to know him so well. And there was a guy named Daryl Shannon from uh, Alliston, Ontario, who I met through a similar chain of events. Just, you know, you get to meet a guy and there's a yeah. text and then, it, you know, you just don't leave it because you, you so admire that person's insight. And Brad was a great compass for me on labor negotiations and things that were going on in terms of... Uh, the league, uh, the union, and Batman, and so forth. He was great on just what it was like when they won the cup, what it's like for rookies. Just, a, just a great teacher. And uh, and he introduced me as you as you know, Hillary took me to the Spo right away to meet the Kennedys, who are you know the the children of Forbes Kennedy, who is the one yeah. who began it all. Yeah, he wanted me to understand that history. And uh, Trevor Burt would take me over to Bobby Mack's place and stand in hope. Uh, and and just uh, get to know, you know, the true, I, I would meet Al McAdam, I would meet, uh, you know, Gerard Gallant, I would get to meet all the, the people that have shaped the, the story of hockey on the island. And it's, uh, I mean, in the case of Gallant, it's a connection or a pipeline to Steve Eiserman. In the case of uh, Errol Thompson, it's to Daryl Sittler and Lanny McDonald. I mean, these were unbelievable links that, uh, mm -hmm. that existed on the island. And, and Brad, you know, he, he didn't introduce me to all those folks, but he became for me uh, the one. He, he just was uh, just the most impressive, one of the most impressive people, like a Gretzky, like a Scotty Bowman, to talk hockey. Yeah, and uh, you have mentioned a few times, too, with uh, Trevor Bray. You must have one or two crazy house cat stories, do you? Uh, house cat, yeah. Well, the stupid fox that he had in the house that would scare me. Good, I'd wake up on a floor somewhere, and then he'd have, he'd put his fox Dolly. Uh, he would always put that fox facing me to sort of wake me uh, up in a very surprising way. Uh, he he's uh, again a guy to talk hockey with, as you know. He's with yeah. the Islander, and, uh, does a great job as the maritime scout and, and player development. Or uh, he just a uh, you know he would police everything. Uh, he was the guy that kind of. Uh, was in the background when when we were doing the celebrity type stuff golf tournaments and such so he was a great security eye and uh and then we would just you know talk music and talk sports uh i love uh, he loves the last waltz which is the movie of uh, uh the last time the band ever performed uh there was a movie made of it and uh yeah i just you know, we would sit and watch music videos or we would sit and talk hockey and i i, I shared the vancouver olympics at trevor burt's house um, Heather Moyes, big win. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, got to go to the East Link many times, went in for Gordy Dwyer into the dressing room and spoke to the Islanders. Daniel Sprong was on that team and he's, you know, now. Yeah. Um, but Trevor's just, uh, you know, he's, he's everything you want in a, in a human being. He's, he's got the humility, but he's got the strength. He's a no BS, just a real, very straight shooter, but a very kind straight shooter. yeah no he's he's been nothing but great to me in my time with the islanders so i mean we heard that he's a great security but we also heard that he's a great driver can you give yeah. a little bit of insight on that 
the time we went out for Brad's event. Is that what you mean? Yeah, or, yeah I heard, yeah. heard he was flying like a bat out of hell. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I got tied up in Toronto, couldn't get out of TO because of, uh, I think it was weather issues. So I was more than two hours late to, to Brad's big event in Murray River is where we were doing it at the rink, uh, yeah. Cumberland. And then, so when I landed, we literally had maybe uh, an hour till I was supposed to speak. And we got there in an hour and 12 minutes, which from the Charlottetown airport to Murray River, the rink, it, that can't be right. You know, you just can't make it in an hour <laughs> uh, and 10 minutes, which which is what we did. So I've compared him to Max Verstappen, the Formula One driver. And, and <laughs> naturally, uh, Suzanne drove us back home. I wasn't getting in the car again with uh, Hostcat <laughs> after that performance. And poor Suzanne, she had to drive. It was mist all through the hills. And uh, yeah, Jesse, thank God Jesse was our navigator, their kid, uh, their daughter. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a great, that was a great, you know, thing to do uh, for you know, to see Glenn and Delight is always just the best. And uh, they have that beautiful home that they've yeah. built over Guernsey. Or Guernsey is well, that that's, it? yeah, well, that's, I was told that uh, they had a surprise for him. It was uh, a surprise for Brad and it was supposed to be, his agent was supposed to be the original surprise. But the uh, the Florida Panthers had actually ruined that. They asked if they uh, if he had gotten there okay yet. And oh, then, funny. yeah. And then delighted to come up and uh, told my mom that you were coming. And she said, yeah, Ron McLean's on the way. And I was like, I I said probably a few words I can't say on here. I got pretty excited. But yeah, we were just like, whoa, okay, we, we got to catch this on camera. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, I gave you plenty of warning in a way because <laughs> we needed we needed CSIS and the FBI and the RCMP to get us there. But, yeah. And we, yeah. We used none of them. We just made our own rules up, which is kind of the island way, I think. <laughs> All right. So it's that time of the show, folks. All it's right. The lightning round. Five quick questions. Start somewhat easy for this guest. I mean, we had to go a bit more controversial, <laughs> but they get harder. So are we choosing primetime Gretzky or Connor McDavid? Oh, I'm a Gretzky guy. Uh, and, and the only reason I'd pick Wayne is because of the, again, the beer and the conversation afterwards makes him just the most special person to have ever been around. He, when he picked his uh, Olympic team rant in Salt Lake City, he picked Theron Fleury, who was really up against it, having issues with demons like alcohol and, you know, kind of down and out. He picked Michael Pekka, who had missed an entire season in a labor dispute. He picked Eric Lindros, who just about ended his career with a concussion. That's the kind of guy Wayne is. And I, and Connor is too, to be honest. That's the one of the neatest things about McDavid is his heart. Uh, but for me, it's Wayne. All right. On a day off, are we choosing a James Neal bonfire or golfing with Brad Richards? Uh, <laughs> I, I have to go with the James Neal bonfire because uh, <laughs> it all comes down to beer and storytelling. And obviously James becomes the story, but uh, yeah, he's, he was also a, just a joy. I, I texted him a little bit. I said, I only texted two people ever. Certainly I would keep in uh, contact with earwig was his nickname, which is a long complicated story, but yeah, sorry, but it's James Neal. Yeah. Is there any rumors on him, uh, you know, becoming or turning into broadcast? Well, that's a good idea. You know, I don't know if he has an appetite for it. Uh, he's probably in that year uh, where he's thinking he could still play. Yeah. But uh, yeah, James would be lovely to welcome aboard. Uh, it's a great idea. And we, we would have to just watch the inside jokes because there's, there's a lot of history there. <laughs> but he's, a, you know, there's a guy that uh, obviously got Vegas their first year was a Cinderella run. And he was part of yeah. that. He was with Brad in Dallas when they went on a bit of a Cinderella run there after they knocked off the champion Ducks in 2008 and went deep. I told this story at the uh, at the Brad Richards event. Brad's gone deep into the playoffs five times. Crosby only four times has he gone beyond three rounds or four rounds. Brad's done it five times. And that is saying something. You know, when uh, Daryl Sutter was asked the other day, how do you compare Matthew Kachuk to Tyler Toffoli? He says, well, one of them's won cups and gone deep in the playoffs. He added gone deep in the playoffs because he didn't want to hurt Jerome Aginla. Jerome never won the cup, but Jerome got mm -hmm. him to game seven of the fourth round. And he knows how hard that is. And Brad is like money when it comes to that. And so is James Neal. If you look at his track mm -hmm. record, everywhere he was, uh, teams went deep. All right. Two great Canadian cities with a passionate fan base, to say the least. So which one goes harder? as we millennials say <laughs> playoff Toronto or Vancouver after a cup loss. 
Oh boy. Uh, yeah, I don't want to touch that <laughs> Vancouver. Poor Vancouver. I get, I, I upset them all the time and I did with Alex Burroughs years ago. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to hurt them. It, Toronto, you saw with the Raptors, that's 2 million for the Raptors. You can multiply that by three. If it was uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, it's uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a, an iconic brand with a, uh, you know, very much like uh, the Green Bay Packers or the Yankees or uh, Manchester United. It's one of those. I would I would put Montreal in that, you know, uh, yeah. for sure. But I'll take Toronto over Vancouver on this one. Not so as not to offend Vancouver for those crazy post games. Now, so, uh, would you say that Toronto's cursed right now? Well, the, the story, the curse, if you don't know, is in 1967, they won the cup and there was an event in Montreal called Expo 67. Vancouver hosted it in 1986. It's the World's Fair. It's a big deal. All the world comes and there's all kinds of uh, exhibits, including provincial exhibits. And so when the Leafs won the cup, they took the Stanley Cup into Montreal to uh, Expo 67 and they displayed the Stanley Cup in Montreal. In the <laughs> And that's where the jinx started. They, you know, they offended the, the cradle of sport in our country. And they, I don't know. <laughs> I thought the jinx ended when uh, Carrie Price dressed in the Leaf dressing room during the World Cup in 2016. I thought, good, that that makes up for uh, the cup in Montreal. Carrie Price is in the Leaf dressing room. Everything should be <laughs> fine. But it hasn't worked out that way. They, they've, yeah, they've got their work cut out. Obviously, looks like this, my- this year, right? This year, this is the year. Yeah, <laughs> I was at Blue Jays, Taylor, on that, and so are you mourning that one. So <laughs> I wonder if it's uh, if it's ever going to happen. But I my my dream is to you know broadcast hockey night in Canada long enough to see them do it. But at least I was alive in '67. You guys weren't, but I got to experience. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Not that I'm a Leaf fan. I just uh, I wasn't. <laughs> I that I was. All right. So I remember distinctively. P.K. Subban had an impression of Don Cherry that was to the core perfect. Yeah. Would you rather go on air with P.K. Subban's impression of Don Cherry or Don Cherry himself? Oh, no. Gosh, Don, Don, of course. Uh, <laughs> love P.K. I, I love the Subban family. Carl's, a, you know, I, I love, you know, he, he approaches all this sort of noise uh, by saying, you know, don't get caught up in the weapons of mass distraction. That's Carl saying. So, and it's funny because PK is uh, you know, full of mischief and full of show uh, and creates a, a lot of what I would call good distractions. I think he was great for Carey Price. You know, he kept, he was the lightning rod so that the media would always go to PK. But no, you know the answer to that. It's, uh, there's only mm-hmm. one. Yeah. 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 PK I did choose. Often imitated, uh, never duplicated. <laughs> PK did choose the perfect suit for his impression. Oh my God. Yeah. He must oh, have he, broken into his wardrobe. Yeah, he, he is, there's nobody, uh, maybe Line, Patrick Line is kind of uh, bordering on grapes-esque and everything that he's choosing to wear. But uh, yeah. Subban, Subban for, the, for sure, for a decade, held the, had the crown. Did, uh, did uh, Don ever try and uh, hook you up with this tailor there for the Hockey Night in Canada sessions? No, but I remember one year, years ago, we were doing a Stanley Cup playoff game in St. Louis on April Fool's Day. And so uh, I had uh, the people make up a collar that was just Velcro, but it was a Don Cherry collar that I could kind of snap on right before we started on the air. <laughs> and I could say, it's April Fool's, what's the big deal, you know? And, uh, but he, he started swearing as soon as it, we were just about to go on. <laughs> and, uh, no, not doing that. And uh, that's, that's the closest I got to uh, his garb. <laughs> All right, the most controversial cre- question we have, the best hockey movie or tv show what is it uh yeah i mean it's hard to bet against slap shot uh it's just so it's got the fun in it and i i think that's what made that show i mean newman is newman he's a you know great great actor mm-hmm. uh, i i mean i i feel like i'm missing uh i've enjoyed uh I don't, I don't enjoy those behind the scenes, you know, HBO 24 seven things. There's something about that. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, is a person sexier with their clothes on or off? I, I think, you know, once, once you're in the dressing room, you've kind of lost that, uh, mystique. So those shows mm-hmm. don't really win me over much. Uh, it's did, like, did uh, I'm into the formula one, but I'm not into the formula one because of the drive to survive series. I'm into the formula one because how great the broadcast is. They do an unbelievable job on the actual calling of a race in formula one. It's 
for me, it's the state of the art broadcast in television. Uh, so I'll go slap shot. I just think it, it, it reminds me of, you know, the referee, right? You know, when, when he's, yeah. I got my eye on you, shut up, <laughs> they bleep an anthem, you know. That has to be would, right. would Goon be an honorable, honorable Goon, mention? Jay Baruchel. I did uh, Canada Reads with Jay, and uh, that's a CBC show where each of us takes a book. I always remember uh, Carol Wynn, a wrestler who won Olympic gold. She was defending Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese, who I adore. Like Richard Wagamese has to be one of the greatest writers of all time. And Indian Horse, amazing book. And I kept slagging it for the sake of competition. Like I'm trying to defend my book, David Bergen's. Mm -hmm. uh, uh anyway jay was on that and goon's a goodie for sure uh yeah yeah hard to go against it's like uh i mean will there ever be another don cherry no and there will never be another slap shot all right so who is your real life ogie orgothorpe <laughs> um i would have to say uh scott oak scott oak my colleague yeah. on hockey night in canada has uh has that same, you know, just amazing uh, gift to, to make people's day. So I'd give it to Oki. Sounds good. All right, folks, clearly our biggest episode of Water Boys yet. Ron, thank you very much for hopping on. We appreciate you. Same, Grant. I'll see you when I'm down there. And uh, Justin and Taylor, lovely to see yeah. you guys too. So keep up the great work. Yeah. We're, we're honored to have you on and thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. Grant, do you want to tell everyone where? You, they can find us of course since you've got my boom box <laughs> folks you can find us on at waterboys underscore media on instagram and official waterboys podcast on instagram two very different accounts we hope you appreciate both on twitter at official waterboys pod and on facebook as well now of course you're probably listening to this on youtube spotify podcast apple podcasts like and subscribe follow along never miss an interview like this again all right Justin, I think you got a little present there for you that I left you. Um, why don't you go ahead and do my role of playing these folks? Out. Me, and, me and Taylor can do it together. Yeah, there we go. Uh, here's the team thing. Effort. Let's send everyone up, boys. Yeah.